thanks Thomas and Elio for uh, having me. Yeah, so I, as the title says, I'm talking mostly about uh, this compared to calcium ruthenate and the physics that we identified there. So the question is, of course, why? Uh, ruthenates in general, I think, I mean, it's clear why one might be interested uh, the superconductivity in the strontium ruthenate. So strontium ruthenate is a lot more metallic than the compound we're looking at. So we're not going to discuss superconductivity here. Uh, what they share is many other features. Uh, one knows that correlations, kinetic energy, spin orbit coupling are important. It's also clearly the case that there is orbital degeneracy, which obviously raises the question of coupling to the lattice. Uh, here downstairs is kind of the phase diagram and the superconducting strontium compound is on the right hand side. It's not very much distorted. And I'm going to talk about the left hand side to so this green antiferromagnetic regime. This is the calcium ruthenate. And as you see, they're quite similar, but the calcium ruthenate here is, is more distorted. And the big physical difference is insulating at low temperatures. So why ruthenates? Well, probably interesting uh, in, in general, but why the calcium ruthenate? We were really interested in the magnetism. And in particular, what I'm going to talk about is the spin orbit coupling, where it's relevant, where it is less so, and what it does. And we came from the idea of, well, we started with spin orbit coupling and correlations for one hole, and here one has two holes. So then what happens? Because correlations then act quite differently and in, in some, to some extent, one cannot argue them away even in effective pictures. And there was the proposal by Guignet with the excitonic magnetism uh, for calcium ruthenate, where we wanted numerically to check uh, how far that picture carries us and, and uh, how it works. And, and the last part will be on temperature effects. Uh, what we're going to see is that spin orbit coupling is really important at low temperatures, but we also see in the numerics how it gets less relevant at higher temperatures. Yeah, so our starting point was from spin orbit coupling and correlations in iridates with one hole. So this is one of the classic topic, topics of correlated and spin orbit coupled compounds, uh, where the idea is here on the right hand side, one has a single hole in the T2G bands. And because of spin orbit coupling, this is actually a single hole in the J effective one half subband. So this year, so that this J effective one half band then is half filled and makes a mod insulator. And this is for a single hole. And then we have all this nice physics that we're interested in, for example, the Kitaev model on the honeycomb lattice. So this is a story that most people know. Uh, if we have a 90 degree bond angle, then these anisotropic interactions like the Kitaev terms here with the JK or also the gamma terms, they become quite important. And this leads to well frustration, of course, and with the right uh, ratio of the parameters to a spin liquid. And that is what we would like to have. On the other hand, I mean, this uh, similar compounds, the J effective picture has really been studied on, on many lattices. And what was nice is on the square lattice compound, the strontium iridate down here, one really can analyze it very well. And, and that really supported the picture because in this compound, what it turned out that this J effective one half picture is extremely robust. And, and that then also, of course, gave a lot of credibility to the idea of trying to define a Kitaev to, to find a Kitaev spin liquid in a honeycomb compound. And it's a bit similar what we're going to do here. I mean, I'm going to argue that we would really be interested also in this two hole scenario on with a 90 degree bond angle. And the square lattice is something where we might more easily figure out whether it's feasible at all. So what happens if we have two holes instead of one? One has to worry about uh, the correct coupling of the angular momenta. So if we had a non-interacting system, uh, we would just get both holes into the J one half state. So that would be J, J coupling. So this is on the left-hand side here. The two holes are now in the J one half system. And that would be appropriate if spin orbit coupling is large. So then comes a large gap. This is a band insulator. And, and the excited states are separated by a large gap. So probably not too much happens here. On the right hand side is if Hunsul coupling is important and actually larger than, uh, than, than spin orbit coupling, then we would talk about LS coupling. 
So the two holes would first be coupled to a total spin one and the effective orbital angular momentum also to an L equals one. And the spin orbit coupling then acts on, on those and prefers a singlet in, in this scenario because it's holes. And the important thing is here, the first excited state is also at the scale of lambda, but lambda is here not the big parameter, it's the small parameter. So we have states that are not too far above the ground state and something interesting could hopefully happen. And this is the scenario we're going to look at. So here in from, from the paper by Guignard, uh, the ground state is the singlet. So if we just had a single ion, that would probably be boring, but the triplets are not that high in energy. So super exchange can mix them in and can then allow magnetism. Uh, similar ideas are also discussed in coupled singlet dimers. So where each dimer would be a singlet, but if you couple the dimers, you can get magnetism. So here, the question is, uh, why would we want this? And where might this be relevant? And the first part, why would we want this? I'm going to talk about the honeycomb model. Uh, and where might this be relevant? I'm going to discuss the calcium ruthenate. So on the honeycomb, one would then write a boson kitai heisenberg model. So the first term here is the spin orbit coupling. The spin orbit coupling just wants the ionic singlet ground state. This doesn't want any magnetism at all. Uh, but if we have some uh, sites that are in a triplet, then this can move with the J. The J can also create two triplets on neighboring uh, sites. And uh, it doesn't have to be J, it can also be anisotropies that have the same form as Kitaev and gamma terms, so they also get the same letter, the K and, and uh, the, the gamma. And finally, there are also higher order terms, but as long as there are not too many triplons, they're not so important. Uh, one can get these couplings with the perturbation theory. Uh, if there is no Hunsrul coupling, then the R, the, the regimes that one would find, uh, yeah, positive J and, and, and J equals minus K, uh, but that's not very realistic. So in reality, one, one would have to take into account Hunsrul coupling and one can then find out other parameter combinations, especially Hunsrul coupling, of course, promotes ferromagnetism. Uh, yeah, anyone on the right-hand side, this is again this idea with the 90 degree bond angle and for a parameter combination that is not completely impossible, one would actually have each flavor moving only along one dimensional paths. Okay, so the first thing, of course, that we did was to calculate the phase diagram. That was first actually a bit disappointing. Uh, here, we went through all a variety of possible parameter combinations. Here is only J and K. The gamma we can also have, but because it's a bit disappointing, I don't want to talk too much about it. The disappointing part is that the liquid that does occur here is topologically trivial. So we have antiferromagnetic, ferromagnetic phases and the zigzag phase, and we also have a liquid, but in itself, it's not terribly interesting. Yeah, so this is this liquid, and we also know it's a liquid, so that's fine in principle. And turned out that the most interesting regime was actually the one without magnetic order. So the black down there, because the y-axis on this plot is uh, how strong are the nearest neighbor magnetic couplings compared to spin orbit couplings. So this is this A here that scales both the Heisenberg and the Kitaev-like symmetric couplings. And if that is small, then spin orbit coupling is relatively large and the system is a paramagnet. And it turns out that this paramagnet has interesting excitations. So this would be the limit where lambda is relatively large. We don't have many triplons. Uh, so we can basically just uh, focus on the hopping of the triplons because if we have one, it can hop. And, and here we also focus on the paramagnetic regime without magnetic ordering. And uh, it turns out that these bands are at first all topologically trivial. And in principle, it's known that one can have non-trivial triplons. So, uh, there are a few papers where this has been discussed. And we found here that if we add a magnetic field into the picture, then we very robustly get topologically non-trivial triplon bands. So that you see here, this is a kind of phase diagram. Again, this is without gamma, but adding gamma does not qualitatively change this too much in the sense that we have topologically non-trivial bands everywhere. The x-axis is the parameter alpha that changes the ratio of the two couplings that are taken into account in this plot. 
And again, the y-axis, that gives the strength of a magnetic field out of plane. And the colors is somehow denote the uh, topological bands that we find, the numbers give the churn numbers. And the thing I want to draw your attention to is that there is something everywhere in the plot. So there are very, very few wide regimes. If you're perfect, perfect Heisenberg coupling, then you don't get topologically non-trivial bands. And if the magnetic field is just way too small, then neither. But otherwise, as soon as you have this triplon model, and as soon as you have a magnetic field, you get topologically non-trivial excitations. And this is something that we found quite interesting. This is also more robust here than it would be in these singlet dimer systems, where one gets topologically non-trivial bands, but typically not quite as robustly. So this is why we are after this physics. OK, now, is this remotely relevant? where might this physics be relevant? The first idea was iridium that had after all worked quite well for the single hole, so why not for two? Uh, the problem is it works a bit too well. So the spin orbit coupling is really large and the iridiums in these double perovskites are very far apart. So the inter-iridium-iridium -iridium coupling is pretty small and they're most probably non-magnetic. So it's just that this on-time singlet is really strong. If you look at the right-hand picture, uh, this ground state, or even on, on the right-hand pictures, the, the lambda is just too big. So the picture is applicable, but uh, just too robust, the singlet. And, and actually, this might be more towards the JJ coupling. So iridium, at least in the terrible double perovskites, where the iridiums are far apart, uh, it's a bit, yeah, spin orbit coupling is too strong. Then the idea with the calcium ruthenate, where, I mean, first makes sense because spin orbit coupling is a bit weaker. And also the antiferromagnetic order there has a very clear XY anisotropy that one sees in the spectra. And the biggest tip off that it's XY is if you look in the spectrum around the gamma point, so it's zero, zero, then it has a maximum. For a Heisenberg antiferromagnet, you will find a minimum. Here is a maximum. And the overall picture of these excitations is very well explained with the J equals zero, J equal one scenario, and, and especially this maximum. Okay. However, it's a bit complicated because on the other hand, it's true one can also explain it with assigning a smaller role to spin orbit coupling. So uh, especially the, the high temperature metal insulator transition, also the idea was that spin orbit coupling might be ver very important there. And that turned out not to be the case. It's rather a correction, uh, works quite well without spin orbit coupling. And the idea then would be, we have a strong orbital polarization, we have a spin one, and we look here at excitations of spin one. For the magnetic excitations, of course, spin orbit coupling is important and it's somehow increased by correlations. And that is why the spectrum would look, uh, would, would show a much stronger spin orbit coupling than one might otherwise expect. Yeah, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to, well, figure out a bit how in which parts of the physics of calcium ruthenate is it better to start from spin orbit coupling and treat crystal field as a correction and where might it be the other way around. So we wanted a model. Uh, model studies because after all we want to know uh, how far is our compound from other scenarios. Uh, so we want to and also we want to go to clear cases so that we know what we're looking for in the numerics. We want to know this uh, excitonic magnetism that comes from this interplay of on-site singlet and triplet, and how does it differ from a normal spin one magnetism? And to do so, we want to first tune our model to clear limits so that we know what we're looking at. And what did we do? The Merrick's the variational cluster approach where we solve a small cluster exactly and then embed that into a larger system. And we also did just brute force exact diagonalization spectra for uh, to get results that we can co uh, compare to the neutron scattering data. And then we also did the same for more material specific parameters that we got from a Bernier projection, the one particle parameters, and also some from experiments. Um, yeah, we can get parameters with lots of details. It turns out often the results do not qualitatively change a lot if one, it, adds more detail. Uh, the most the result that we got for the parameters that are material specific is that one particle spectra do really not show spin orbit coupling. So of course one can include it, but doesn't really uh, do a lot. 
but the magnetic spectra, they depend very much on spin orbit coupling, and I'm going to discuss in more detail how. And uh, for the crystal field versus spin orbit coupling, we find that the best explanation of the magnetism is that yes, it's excitonic magnetism, even though orbital polarization is quite strong. The only thing that is really important for the excitonic magnetism is that orbit, orbital polarization must not be perfect, but it's quite okay with strong orbital polarization. So one sees that in the cartoon down there, left-hand side with the very colorful uh, clouds here, that would be the pure excitonic insulator and it's colorful because all the three orbitals are mixed in with equal weights. It's the left-hand side. Right-hand side would be dominant crystal field. The dominant crystal field wants the blue orbital, the XY, to be doubly occupied and the, the other two orbitals are then half filled. They make a spin one and that's a kind of a normal antiferromagnet. And calcium ruthenate is of course in the middle. And what we're going to argue is that it's really uh, quite possible to have both pictures uh, together. And for the magnetic excitations, it's most helpful to give a strong role to spin orbit coupling. Yeah, so the model, uh, yeah, that's a standard thing. Uh, kinetic energy, of course, where we did the two things of doing just a very simple nearest neighbor model or use couplings from density functional theory and Vanier projection. And as long as we don't choose very strange nearest neighbor couplings, the results are very consistent. So the difference is not that large. Uh, tetragonal crystal field, as I said, because we want to have that interplay. Spin orbit coupling, which is also a one particle term, of course, and can be written in the form that it is given here. And finally, on-site Coulomb and Holmes interactions. Yeah, the one particle operate uh, parameters from the Vanier projection and the relevant bands are the one in the red window. As one sees, I mean, there's a fairly nice gap, gap above and even below. One can reasonably argue that one can separate them from the next lowest bands so that one gets popping parameters. Uh, we restricted ourselves to some uh, dominant ones. One can include more, but results then no longer change. So we stopped including more. Um, and these hoppings we also used, I'm going to show for which points. Yeah, so the method was variational cluster approximation. As I said, we solve a small cluster exactly. We get its free energy and its one particle Green's function. From the one particle Green's function, we get the self energy. And the self energy after all carries the information about the interactions. So we plug the self energy into the Green's function of a big cluster or even an infinite system. And what is nice is one can make the self-energy symmetry broken by adding a small symmetry breaking field to the cluster and then insert the symmetry broken self-energy into the fully symmetric Hamiltonian of the big system. And if this lowers the grand potential, then we know that the big system prefers the symmetry broken self-energy and we infer that it would like to do symmetry breaking. An example would be here, the plot with the colors. The colors denote what kind of symmetry is broken. Uh, the orange was a complicated stripy state with spin and orbital order. And the blue is a checkerboard antiferromagnetism as it is observed in the calcium ruthenate. So one sees here that one needs a finite uh, spin orbit coupling for that. And the light blue and the dark blue, this is a minor difference. This is which exact, which combination of spin and orbital gives the very lowest brand potential. But that is a really minor thing. Okay, so yeah, what does this uh, plot show us? This shows us here, we don't have any crystal field and that was where we wanted to understand what the excitonic magnet looks like in our approach. And what we find is in the blue regime, when we have it without order, we have the gray symbols, then most of the weight is in the on-site singlet state that you see here. But at, once we add magnetic order, we go to the black symbols and then uh, this weight is reduced and we have more weight in the J equals one. So in these triplet states, because the magnetism after all mixes in the triplons. And we also see the higher total angular momentum J equals two that is irrelevant once spin orbit coupling is large enough to induce checkerboard order. Yeah, uh, that was the, the full thing that J equals zero is unimportant. Ah, uh, yeah, and the gray phase, I forgot to ask uh, to say the gray phase is when spin orbit coupling is so large that there's only a paramagnetic. 
Now, the interesting question was, after all, what about the crystal field? We know it's there. That's the cartoon we had before, where we know that we go a bit towards this direction here with the fully occupied XY orbital. Uh, yeah, we know that they're almost uh, that we occupied uh, theory and, and ARPIS there agree quite well that this, so the ARPIS tells us that the theory description is quite good and the theory description tells us that the XY is nearly fully occupied. Uh, and so we need to include the crystal field. Now we do that the same calculation with the crystal field. The big difference here is that even without spin orbit coupling, we now have the checkabout, a checkerboard order that is seen in experiment. So that is clear. Here, the blue would be the checkerboard order uh, that is isotropic, I mean, it's without spin orbit coupling. And in the green regime, it's within the plane. The red and orange here is the uh, DFD derived hoppings and the black lines is uh, the model. So with just nearest neighbor hopping and variable crystal field. And what we see here is the densities in the orbitals and we see the uh, actually the whole density and we see that the XY really does not contain a lot of the whole. It would be completely occupied without spin orbit coupling and it contains about 20% of the whole for well, about realistic spin orbit coupling. So orbital polarization is clearly quite strong. On the other hand, we also see that if spin orbit coupling is I don't know, maybe 50% larger than what is realistic, then we would completely lose magnetic ordering because then it wins. Uh, so it's also that spin orbit coupling is not so weak. It can have an impact on magnetism. So now a bit more the, the other observables. On the left-hand side here, we see again the weight in the states with the total angular momentum. And we see again that spin orbit coupling Spin orbit coupling getting larger promotes, of course, the on-site singlet. That's the J equals zero. And we see what we also saw before that uh, if we go from paramagnet, that's gray, to magnetic, that's black, then we get less weight in the singlet and more weight in the triplet. It turns out, however, that it's better not to just look at orbital, uh, a total angular momentum, but instead to diagonalize the on-site thing where we can take crystal field into account. The crystal field is in orbital language and an LZ, uh, LZ squared term. And then we really find very clearly the picture we had before. The lowest singlet state is the gray one. This is very favored for the non-magnetic solution. If, once we go to the magnetic solution, we get a bit more weight into the next two states. That's a, a doublet. Uh, and any higher states that would correspond to the J equal two states from before are irrelevant. So we really can explain everything in terms of these three states, the lowest energy singlet and the doublet that comes after. And that is exactly the excitonic magnetism picture. So that works quite well for the magnetic ordering here. So we wanted to look at excitations. Uh, the Hamiltonian is second order where the perturbation theory, where the relevant thing is what is the low energy Hilbert space. We include all states with total orbital angular momentum one and total spin equals one. So we can do the limit without spin orbit coupling, but we can of course also include spin orbit coupling. That's the last line and the Hamiltonian is a bit ugly, but it's also standard. And then one can calculate magnetic excitation spectra. We did, that with, did this with exact diagonalization for eight sites, which is not large. Uh, we get here spectra, the red and the blue is in plane versus out of plane, because with spin orbit coupling, that's of course not equivalent. And the nice thing is, so these are the parameters that were derived from DFT. And the agreement with experiment is quite good, especially considering that we don't have a single cheating parameter here. So we had nothing more to fit. That was just it. And, and for that, that's really nice agreement. So we get the energy scale, we get definitely that maximum at zero, zero here. And that's quite nice. It also turns out if we change the parameters, then the spectra do change. So it's not that this is so robust that one also get, always gets it. And the one change I want to talk about is if we turn the crystal field so large that the XY orbital is really perfectly doubly occupied, then this maximum at zero, zero disappears. So the excitonic magnetism can coexist quite well with orbital polarization as long as this orbital polarization is not perfect. And that's enough to get this very 
characteristic feature. Yeah, the last thing we also looked at was temperature. So we have now is established that the magnetism is best explained if we focus on spin orbit coupling. Arpis, on the other hand, does not really need spin orbit coupling, and the high temperature does not really need it either. So there is a metal insulator transition that goes together with the lattice distortion at higher temperatures, quite a bit above the nail temperature. At that transition, the XY orbital becomes nearly filled, and one can understand stand that quite well as an orbital selective mob transition. And, and also, I mean, in the magnetism, I just argued that this nearly filled is really important, that it's not completely filled. But for this high temperature picture, that's not important. For this high temperature picture, we could also just say, well, it's filled. And then there is another thing. There's a strange additional transition between the mob and the nail transitions. It's not so clear, rather a crossover than a transition, maybe. And the orbitals presumably change somehow. However, it's also known that the unit cell remains the same, so it can't be some larger unit cell orbital order. And it also turns out that orbital densities are not that much affected. So what we wanted to do is look at temperature regimes that are above the nail temperature, but still well within the insulating regime. To do so, we wrote a finite temperature variant of the variational cluster approach. This was quite some numerical work. So the basic equation that one also always has is one has the grand potential calculated from the cluster. So the left hand uh, from that, that one wants for the peak system uh, is the one calculated from the cluster. And then one adds and subtracts Green's functions. The one is the Green's function from the cluster. And the second one is the effective Green's function that one calculates for the peak system. And that also works at finite temperature. Uh, yeah, we. Much of it is described in that paper uh, down there in, in that peer B, and, and we made some modifications. For example, one needs to do to use band lunches because there might be near degeneracies, and if one is no longer at t equals zero, that's important. Also, we did a high frequency expansion for the Green's function, and uh, well, what we then get is entropy and specific heat, and this is an example for a pure spin one system, which we got by just making the crystal field very large. And then what we see on the left-hand side is a magnetic order parameter. Spin orbit coupling is irrelevant here because uh, this is a spin one system anyway, and there's no, no orbital degree of freedom left to couple to. And on the right-hand side, we see the specific heat and we see the one peak at the transition. So that is what we expect for a spin one system. And then- Sorry, Maria, yeah, very quickly. Yeah. So, uh, you're speaking already a bit more than 25 minutes. So if you want to have a, a minute or two for questions. This slide. Perfect. Last one. Mm -hmm. So that we have this, uh, if we go to realistic crystal fields, then we have an additional feature in the specific heat. So that's this hump above the transition. And the question is what changes there? So we looked at various observables. And here on the right-hand side, you see for weak to strong spin orbit coupling on the top uh, row, the densities. And I mean, Vanishing spin orbit coupling may be different, but for the realistic, more realistic spin orbit couplings, this does change, but not a lot. What changes a lot more, one sees that really here very well, is the weight in the states with uh, orbital angular momentum. So we would argue that what we see in this enigmatic intermediate transition is where spin orbit coupling finally kicks in, where temperature becomes low enough that it becomes relevant to the system. And this is the transition from the high temperature regime where it's not important to the low temperature regime where it is. Yeah, so the people were involved, the pictures of some of them, Michi and Pavel and Teresa, uh, Friedemann and Pascal, uh, also there, Philip, I noticed in the audience, Jan and discussions with Dina, George and Hide. And yeah, so now I'm done. My summary was that we're interested in this J equals zero, J equals one physics, because it can give topologically non-trivial excitations. And I argued that um, the square lattice ruthenate is really well understood with this picture of excitonic magnetism. And finally, also how that uh, the importance of spin orbit coupling gets lost at higher temperatures. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>